What's up, what's up, good people? We're back at it again. And listen, Linda, there's a lot of energy right now, and I love it. People are watching the WNBA. I mean, I know we had our most viewed season on TV and everything, but there's so many conversations happening. So, of course, I'm going to get into the of the year awards. They announced MVP. They announced Defensive Player of the Year. So I'm going to talk about it. But I'm really excited to talk to Sheila Johnson, co-founder of BET, multi-sports owner, NBA, WNBA, NHL, all that jazz. I'm talking to Sheila Johnson. Also connects to the WNBA, but exciting conversation. She is the OG and I get to talk to her. Let's go! So what's up, good people? You know we're talking WNBA because it's WNBA playoffs. There's also NFL going on. So before I get to the WNBA playoffs, let me talk a little NFL real quick. So our Falcons lost. We were one of the undefeated teams. Now there's only three teams remaining undefeated. Um, our Falcons lost, but progress, baby, okay? It's like, I don't know. I still think that we could be division champs. I'm still keeping that out there, but I'm going to tell you right now, the Miami Dolphins, you know, like, obviously, we're the Levitar show, so we know we have Miami over here. Them Dolphins is looking all right, though. They dropped a 70-piece nugget. It felt like a basketball score. It felt like what's going on. And then there's a lot going on with that. There's a side note. Some fans are mad because – the coach allowed fans to pick plays in the second quarter. Not really, though. They're saying that it got ran up so much that it was a joke. And they said that they weren't running up the score. I don't know how to feel about that because I've never been mad at somebody that beat me so bad. Like, you know, like it's like I, I don't know if I could fix my mouth to say like y'all was doing too much. Y'all ran up the score on us. It's like I don't know if my pride would allow me to say that, but either way. You know, they didn't want to run up the score. Miami talked about how they didn't want to run up the score. So that's why they didn't. But I just don't know how to feel about people being mad about people that run up the scores, unless it's kids. If it's kids, I'm like, you don't really want to run up the score on kids. It might make a kid never play sports again. You don't want to do that. But when we talking professional athletes, grown man league, grown woman league, it's hard to be mad as a competitor when somebody beats you so bad that it's embarrassing that I felt like he was running it up. So it's like, I don't really know. The Dolphins dropped 70 points. It's crazy, but it was fun. Like, they're a high-powered offense. It was fun to watch. Now on to the WNBA playoffs, but also, side note to the playoffs, it's award season, so the of the year awards are coming out. We know that Asia Wilson got Defensive Player of the Year, and I start with that because we already know the other announcements um, – Rookie of the Year, Aaliyah Boston. I don't even know if that's been announced yet. It's kind of like we just all understand that. Most Improved Player ended up being Satu over there in Dallas. And then they announced the Defensive Player of the Year. It ended up being Asia Wilson. So when that announcement happened and everybody heard that Asia Wilson was going to be the Defensive Player of the Year, Don Staley actually had put out a series of tweets basically like, you know, I feel like everybody's setting this up so that, you know, Asia Wilson is a defensive player of the year and that either so, – basically she's not going to be the MVP. So fast forward now to we know the MVP is Stewie, Brianna Stewart. And honestly, here's my thing because I – about three weeks ago they had us do our picks for TV. You know, I do WNBA Weekly over there on NBA TV. And they have me select my choices because it is a regular season award. So – a lot of times people forget that your mindset on how that player played should end at the last regular season game. How they're playing in the playoffs should not really have any effect on an of the year award as the MVP because it's a regular season award. So I say that to say I picked my choices about two, about a week ago, a week ago. Hey, but no, I picked my choices probably about, I don't know, two or so weeks ago. Um, and my choices, just so I'm transparent, I picked, let me remember, I picked, yeah, Aaliyah Boston as Rookie of the Year. I did pick Side 2 as Most Improved. I picked Brittany Sykes as Defensive Player of the Year. And then that went into a whole discussion about guards. It's hard for a guard to win awards. Like, it's hard for guards to win Defensive Player of the Year awards because rebounding a lot of times gets factored in. 
And rebounding, of course, is a thing that post players pretty much dominate. Um, and then, you know, there's the steals category, but then there's also the blocks category. So when you think about those types of things, those are rebounds, blocks, those are things that post players usually dominate in. So I had picked Brittany Sykes. I call her slime because I just saw her getting after it. Um, she was leading the league, I think, in most of the year in steals. I think Jordan Canada ended the season um, leading in steals. But just her activity. I mean, she was active, baby. She was getting over the screens. She was, you know, just that nightmare on defense when you're the other team. So I picked her as my defensive player of the year. But I, I also had, so having said that, I had Asia Wilson as my MVP. My reasoning for having Asia Wilson as my MVP is because I'm going to just call it the Maya Moore bias then because I played alongside Maya Moore for a lot of my career. I played alongside of her at UConn, and then I played alongside her in the WNBA for the Minnesota Lynx. And honestly, I think a lot of years Maya Moore was the best player in the actual WNBA. Like, I think that if you, you know how now they ask their peers and I don't really know about that peer question anyway. Like, I don't know if people are answering it for real, but I just know that I played against Maya Moore in the WNBA and I played with her. And I know that she was pretty much the hardest player to scout because she can score on bigger players. She can score on smaller players. She was, she can shoot the ball. Well, she was that matchup nightmare. But I watched year after year her not get MVP awards. I watched year after year where it was like, of course, Maya Moore is good, but this person may have scored two more points per game than her or one more points per game than her. So I call that the Maya Moore bias where it's like, we know Maya Moore is the best player in the league. She happens to be playing alongside other superstars like Simone Augustus, Sylvia Fowles, Rebecca Brunson, and Lindsey Whalen. But we also know that Maya Moore is the best player on the best team. And so I, like I said, I don't have a vote. So I'm making sure everybody knows I don't have a vote. But for TV, they would have me make my picks. And so I picked Asia Wilson because Asia Wilson at the end of the year was the best player on the best team. So I just feel like when it's that kind of situation, there's a one point difference. Asia Wilson averaged 22 points per game, I think, and Stewie averaged 23 points per game. But basically when the numbers are almost synonymous and they're almost very similar, I'm always going to go with the best player on the best team because they're the best player and they're also on the best team. And so I don't, but I also understand Alyssa Thomas had a historic year. So when people have a historic year, like Russell Westbrook, when he was Mr. Triple Double, I understand him being MVP. I mean, he had something done that's never been done before. I think he averaged a triple double and it had never been done before. So I understand the thought process behind other people being candidates. I understand the thought process behind Stewie. You know, she leads the league in points per game. Well, she leads that category more than Asia in points per game and more than Alyssa Thomas in points per game. So some people are like, hey, I just go by the stats. So I understand everything. That's why I tweeted out that, if you don't agree with my choices, I understand. The WNBA is talented. There's a lot of talent out there. There's a lot of choices. It's an opinion at the end of the day that you can say is based on things, but it's basically what you value. And so I'm just basically stating that I have the Maya Moore bias where I played with the best player and we a lot of times were on the best team and she may have gotten looked over. So Asia Wilson is my MVP, but Tap in, y'all. These these semifinals, these WNBA playoffs have been big, big lit, baby. Can't wait. All right, so now that we've talked WNBA, it's actually only fitting because I talked about my thoughts on MVP and all the of the year awards, and Sheila Johnson is the original, like the first. The one to do it in a sense of we're going to get I, like you're going to hear our conversation, but I just want to talk about her for a second, because even when I knew that I was going to become a co-owner of the Atlanta Dream, I thought about Sheila Johnson because it was like I knew that there was somebody that had already done it. We also know Lisa Leslie has been an owner of the Los, um, Los Angeles Sparks. But when I was talking to Sheila Johnson, you guys, it was crazy because you're looking at a woman that has done everything that you want to do. Like, it's not everything, like you're not talking to somebody that might have an idea of how you should get there. I'm not talking to somebody that is guessing on what it would be like when you get there. I'm literally talking to Sheila Johnson, 
a woman that's already been there, a woman that's been in places that, first of all, not many women have been in, but also especially not many Black women have been in. She's been in rooms that we can only dream of. She's she's owned assets. She's a billionaire. I mean, just think about that. She is a walking, breathing billionaire. And even when I asked her about it, which you're going to hear about, her thought process behind that is interesting too. Because you know I'm into the TV shows. I'm so happy to hear that the strike is ending and all that's going on. I mean, there's so many thought processes that I have when I think about Sheila Johnson because we all think about Oprah, don't we? We all know that Oprah is somebody that's been in the room where it happens, but we're talking about Sheila Johnson has too. And so Sheila Johnson, just for me, like you guys, like I want people to understand our history and Sheila Johnson is somebody that is doing it, you know, and she's doing it for, for women's sports. You know, she, we talk about it. I ask her like, why did you say yes to sports when you was already, you, you started BET. Like who does that? She started BET. So it's just like, she, like you guys, I'm talking to Sheila Johnson tap in this is a conversation of conversations and i'm happy to have had it let's get it what's up what's up good people we're back at it again and listen linda there's a lot of energy right now and i love it people are watching the WNBA. i mean i know we had our most viewed season on tv and everything but there's so many conversations happening. So, of course, I'm going to get into the of the year awards. They announced MVP. They announced Defensive Player of the Year. So I'm going to talk about it. But I'm really excited to talk to Sheila Johnson, co-founder of BET, multi-sports owner, NBA, WNBA, NHL, all that jazz. I'm talking to Sheila Johnson also connects to the WNBA, but exciting conversation. She is the OG and I get to talk to her. Let's go. Hello. We got a legend in the building. Okay. Cause I mean, honestly, you're the prototype for, for someone like me in a sense of you've already been everywhere that I'm trying to go. So let me just tell everybody who we have on here. We have Sheila Johnson, a businesswoman, co-founder of BET, CEO of Salamander Hotels and Resorts, and the first billion, billionaire African-American woman who has now released a new memoir. It's called Walk Through Fire, a memoir of love, loss, and triumph. So welcome to Montgomery and Co. Miss Sheila Johnson. Well, thank you. But Renee, you forgot one thing. I'm also an owner of the Washington Mystics. I was going to get to that. You know I didn't forget. Oh, yeah. I was, I was going to get, listen, because you were there already. That's what, I'm glad you said it because owner of the Washington Mystics, congratulations, you guys made it to the playoffs this year. Always have a solid team. And so let's just start there because how did you get into sports? Uh, just how did that happen? Well, you know, this is something that we parallel. You know, the opportunity just came up. And it was a case where um, a Poland, who had already owned the Capitals, had sold it to Ted Leonsis. Ted had first right to the Wizards once a passed away. But a Poland's the one that actually opened that door for me. He um, called me in his office one day and he says, I want you to be the face of a WNBA team. And I said, what do you mean by be the face of? He says, well, I'd like you to own it. And I said, well, does it make money? He goes, well, you know, none of the teams really make money. He says, uh, but here's the financials and let me know. And I knew right away I wanted to do it. I had the wherewithal to buy it. And not only that, that opened a door, not just for me, but all the women like you out there. I said, somebody's got to start this. And that was really important. So that's how I got into it. And I called Ted Leonsis and I said, you know, I've been offered the Washington Mystics, but I also want to buy into the Wizards and the Caps. Let's so go. There we are. So there we are. That's OK. So I was going to that's so you buy into the Washington Wizards, just so people know, and the Capitals and Again, people have to understand because now it's almost getting to where I know you see it now where there's a lot of people getting into sports ownership, athletes, yeah. entrepreneurs. This is way before it was even like right now. I think it's sexy to get into sports ownership, but right. you were in there before, like you said, there was profits being turned and you was just in there. So it was like 
what made you know, all right, I'm not just getting into the WNBA, I'm getting to the NBA, I'm getting to the NHL. Like, what was the thought process with that? Because that's where the money's made. You know, the men's sports, you know, they, they came on long before we did, mm-hmm. the WNBA. But over the years, incrementally, you know, advertisers are buying into it. They got TV rights. They've got everything. So that platform was set. And I wanted to be able to attach my mystics to that platform to be able to financially support them. Wow. Okay. So, and across the NFL, just to give people an idea, I want to, I love that. So across the NFL, NBA and MLB, there are six women owners in the NFL, the Titans, the Bears, the Lions, the Bills, 49ers and Rainers. And the NBA, there's one full owner and that's the Jazz and one asterisk, the Nuggets. But the NHL only has one asterisk, the Avalanche, while Major League Baseball is pretty much living to the reputation of the old where there's not a lot of diversity. So, like, how do you think that the numbers of women and minorities in the sports ownership is going to change? Because we've seen the Dallas Cowboys owner, Jerry Jones, has mentioned that he would love to see it. It's been talked about a lot. But realistically, knowing what you know, like, is there a path, like, what is that pathway? Well, first of all, let's talk about the NFL. The selling prices on those teams are like in the clouds right now. Right. And, um, you know, I was even approached when the commanders were sold and said, would you be interested in doing that? The The price tag on these teams is a little bit out of the ordinary. Mm-hmm. Um, Major League Baseball getting there. I just really think that um, I think me as a woman and all the women out there, we're starting to see a shift in women ownership into like soccer. Mm. You see it, you see it in soccer and you're seeing it in the W. Um, These are sports that we are really interested in and want to grow. And I think if you have the wherewithal, if you want to buy an NFL team, that's fine. You're going to be a 1%, 2% owner. But if you really want to make a difference as far as growing women's sports, I would invest in a soccer team and I would invest in something that I'm really interested in with the W, which I'm already in. but, (laughs) But I mean, you want to really grow women's sports. No, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. And I want people to understand. So I want to get to your book because the reason that I'm asking you is people might be like, well, why are you asking her? I'm like, because you've done it all. And you recently released Walk Through Fire, a memoir of love, loss and triumph, where you tell the story of your upbringing, your relationships with your parents, just all of it. And I'm curious because you are in the public eye. So why now? And were you concerned about like maybe telling too much now with the way that people are in a sense of judgment, like just all your thoughts on releasing a memoir that's so close to you? I think it's important that over the past 30 plus years, I've really gone through a lot. Well, it's been longer than that. I'm not going to give my age away. But from the moment from 16 years old until now, I have had three acts in life. The first act, you know, I was a concert violinist and continued to teach even with the formation of starting BET because I had to keep a roof over our heads. And I had really put so much into helping build that company. And as the company um, was growing and it was, the brand was getting more and more well known. Um, I felt erased out of there. Um, That's something people can read in the book. The third act of my life, of course, is starting another company. But back to your question, I think it's important. There's so many women going through what I went through. And I think that we need to talk with one another. We got to let other women know they're not out there alone. And I suffered for years and years. And what that suffering brought was depression. I was unhappy. I had two kids to raise. And it was just a case that so many people were coming to me. They were like, Sheila, you've got to tell your story. Because there was another story out there that was not really true. And it was just a matter of I had to heal. It was time for me to heal. And by talking about it, I'm healing. I mean, even my daughter even called me about an hour ago. And she says, Mom, I listened to the Audible. I am so proud of you. 
Wow. You know, I just really think that we as women have got to come to grip, and especially in the African-American culture, you know, we're told we're not supposed to let our dirty laundry out there. We're not supposed to do this. It's the way you do it. It's the way you talk about your issues, your problems. It's all therapy. This book that I wrote is very therapeutic. And I've been working on it for two years and just trying to understand why people treat you the way they do. Mm. And through my therapy is because they can. Do you want them to get away with it? No, but that is the reality of life. And it was just a journey on healing for me. I mean, that's that's big because it it is tough to like like you say in our community you supposed to keep everything in house if everything if there's anything wrong you you keep it in house but i do agree with you that transparency like i said you've done everything that i could even think about doing right now you know right now i own a wmba team i'm a co-owner of one but of course i would love to get into more sports ownerships you started bet like i mean you talked about that being a healing process how like now that you've gotten through and healed how is it when you are the founder of something that is a staple for the culture that is still going on to this day? Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting. And I think that all of us, and I want you to keep an eye, uh, an eye on what's going on. BT's up for sale. I thought Tyler Perry had bought it. They didn't accept his bid. I don't know quite what's going to happen to the network. Mm. And I think someone from the Wall Street Journal asked me a really important question. Where do we see the role the BET plays now? Yeah. The world is changing. We got a younger group like you coming up. We are not asking the right questions to you all. Mm -hmm. Where do you think the role of BET or how do you think it should play in your lives? I mean, it's basically a video network. Come on, let's face it. Yeah. I really, when I wanted to start BET and, and really bring it, because it was a, during the birth of all cable, um, is I wanted for young people and older people to have a platform to talk about the issues that are going on in the Black community. I mean, when you look at everything that's happened in these past few years and dealing with Trump issues and everything, BET could have been a very strong platform for you all to get on that network and really talk about what inspires you, why can't we solve our problems. The, the, again, communication has been shut down. We are the only network that really has a voice for the African-American community, and we're squandering. We're squandering a huge opportunity. So that has been something that I've been wrestling with, something that I hope people are thinking about once they buy the network, when it happens, but we've got to make it really um, a network that's really going to start serving the African-American culture much better. My prototype, she is an owner of multiple sports franchises, WNBA franchise in the Washington Mystics, NBA franchise in the Wizards, NHL in the Capitals. Like this woman is doing it. She is everything. And we'll be right back with more. Yeah, and so are you gonna get involved? Do you wanna get involved? Do you care about what happened? Like, cause I mean, you, you know, like you started it, it's your baby. And so you're right. Like, and I, and there is a little caveat. Like I do think that when BET was thriving, 106 and Park days, while it was still talking about music, there was interviews happening on 106 and Park. There was our culture there, front and living color through the music videos. But to your point now, there everything, there's nothing live. There's no right. real energy going into the platform. It's just regurgitating things that have already been produced or already ran. Exactly. Yeah, there's nothing original, nothing that's been brought up to date. Do you remember the show Teen Summit? Yeah. I that know. was my show. Wow. That's the show that I put together and produced. Wow. And it was out of the video market. I didn't like the way young women were being portrayed on camera. I'm not saying that rap and all that wasn't good. What I'm saying, I wanted smart TV watching. I wanted young ladies like you, as you're watching the videos, to look at it and analyze it in a very unique way in the sense this is entertaining, but I'm not going to behave like that in real life. That kind of thing. 
Um, and that show was very, very important. It won all kinds of awards and we were on for 11 years. So um, there's just things, the programming is so important. And that's what we've got to really wrap our arms around. No, I mean, I, I agree. And I'm going back to your memoir because, again, you've lived a lot of different lives. You've been in the media. You talked about being a violinist. I always compare sports and entertainment. Like, I feel like mm -hmm. they're so synonymous. And you they are. You had mentioned that the arts is one of the more important parts to, that you want to focus on and philanthropy and different things. And so when you think about the arts and sports and how they're merging, like, do you like how that's happening? Mean, because right now they really are some honest. If you look at the NBA, you're going to see Quavo or you're going to see Dame Dalla, Damian Lillard. Right. Rapping. Do you like that that arts are infusing with sports? Oh, yeah. What are your thoughts no, on that? the arts are the foundation of life. Let's face it. If I hadn't had an arts background, I don't think I could have had the other two chapters in my life. Arts are so important. They teach you how to organize, to communicate, to think, to visualize, to think out of the box. And from my arts background, I was able to then take it to BET to create Teen Summit and to try and come up with some programming that was not accepted, but, um, there was just so many things that I wanted to do with BET, and I'll tell you where I've carried it on further. I've gone into my third act in life in the hospitality business, and I don't know if you know this, but I actually have curated a film festival. We're going into our eleventh year. In we bring all the yeah, we create, we bring in all the top films that are on their way to the Oscars. I do the family reunion, which is three days of bringing in the top 40 to 45 chefs from across the country of color and so Mayes, and we talk about food from the African diaspora. So this entertainment is still going on for me, even in the hospitality business. And I tell you, if you were there and if you could see my cooks back in the tents and everything and they're jamming because we had Juvenile, we had Joe, we had, no, we have real entertainment. Uh, uh, Dave Chappelle came. I mean, we really put on a festival that is carried on by everything that has happened in the first two phases of my life. And I've taken into the hospitality business. My hotel business is not like Hilton or Marriott or anything. We have fun. And I'm also <laughs> with Caribbean. I'll tell you, we have fun. And I have the most diverse company you've ever seen. And we are now skewing probably, even with my guests, 50-50. You will never see so many people of color coming through the doors in my hotels. We'd love to see it. We'd yeah, because it. I will tell you, they are having a ball. They feel welcome. They feel vested in what I've curated. And uh, it, it's just amazing. So all three of these phases in my life all come together. So all three of those phases in your life, and has equaled you becoming the first billionaire African-American woman. Like, mm -hmm. I can't tell you how much I love that. Like, I, because to me, I think that, you know, we're playing in this world where we see the shows like Succession and Suits and it all looks a certain way. So I'm sitting here looking I at know. you. You know what I'm saying? I'm sitting here uh -huh. looking at you, Miss Sheila, and I'm like, let's go. So like, what is that feel? Like, you're a billionaire? What is like? Yeah, but wow. I don't live my life like succession and, and <laughs> some of these others. Believe me, I don't. Um, I have a really true solid value system. And the core of my value system, I just want to make sure, and I really base it on leadership. And I keep the values of what I want to live by. All of my employees live by that. Um, I have probably one of the best executive teams, I think, in the hotel business. They've all been with me from the very beginning of my company. We bring on the best. And um, <coughs> what I want to share with everybody, and especially young women of color trying to get in, you know, businesses and everything, be careful with who you bring into your environment, in your orbit. Because there's people out there you think are your friends, they aren't. Especially the more successful you become, be very, very careful. I call them energetic vampires. And they will hook on to you and they will take everything from you. They want to live your life. They don't want to work for it. 
And I think for anything, the value system and the work ethic are so, so important. People look at me and they say, oh, you're a billionaire. You've had it easy all your life. No, read my book. I worked for every brick and mortar. Everything that I have achieved is from hard work. And that's what we've got to get back to. And we got to th- start looking at leadership. You're a leader. I mean, look at what you've done. I was so proud of you when it was announced that you were going to become an owner of the dream. And I said, that is terrific. And we need more of this. So continue to work on leadership. It's okay to fail. It's okay to um, fail or, you know, there's nothing wrong with it. Because once you, if you don't experience failure, you won't know how to move forward. You just pivot and go on to a different path. But in my book, the lessons that I wanted to do was I wanted to inspire. I wanted to give women courage that they can move forward no matter what lives they want to build. And most important thing, and this is a hard lesson that I've learned way too late, is don't do anything until you know who you really are. Mm. You have got to know who you are, because if you don't know who you are, there's no way that you can then take that next step. But you've got to be careful. I love that. I'm taking like I'm literally you're speaking directly to me. I'm, I mean, that's why I'm asking the questions that I really want to know, because I feel like mm-hmm. getting a chance to talk to someone like you is rare. And so you talked about like we got to get to the hard work of it. And I think that's why you see a lot of athletes be successful in their second career because of that element what does that look like for balance you know how like a lot of times people like I I'm gonna just be honest like I tell people all the time I don't know what balance is because I was an athlete that was training to be a D1 top athlete that then trained to be a, a WNBA athlete so I didn't have balance like we my whole life was focused on that Does it take that level of focus to reach the highest level or is there a way? (laughs) Cause I don't think like, I have not seen the other way. I'm an athlete. We are like microscopic, like we're focused, but does it take that to reach the billionaire status? Like, do you have to have that? This is my whole life. focus. No, I don't really believe in balance. I believe in living life day to day. And there's doors that'll open. You just need to relax because if you're so focused, you're not going to see those other doors that are opening on the side. You won't see those opportunities coming in. People, it's because of the aura of you're so focused. People are going, oh, well, that person's so focused. I don't need to even bother with them. You want to relax more. Enjoy what you're doing. You have reached the pinnacle of your sports success. You want to continue to run your organization, your team to make it successful, but also do not shut out whatever else is coming along because you don't know which doors are going to open around you and start trusting your instincts. If someone comes along and says, Renee, would you be interested in investing in this? Or do you want to come and help me do this or do that? Look at it carefully, evaluate it, See where it's going to take you to that next step. And then if you feel good about it, carefully get advice and then walk through that door and see if it'll work. The important thing is in any kind of business is you got to diversify. Mm -hmm. I not only have, you know, the hotel companies, I've got the sports teams. I also is 50% owner of a body lotion line, a care line um, of Mistral. I design scarves. I do photography and all of these sorts of things, you know, bring in a little other, more income. But there's just so much that I do do that I think is going to enhance my brand. That's what you want to do. You're a brand. You're the CEO of your own life. Mm-hmm. So what you want to do is you want to enhance the Renee Montgomery brand. And you need to sit back and think long and hard. How else can I diversify? How can I take my name even further in what I do? It could be charity work. Out of that, then that draws attention to you from maybe companies. And say, look, maybe I'd like you to sit on a corporate board. That brings in more income for you. So there's all sorts of things that you want to take into account. And um, 
the world's your oyster. Wow. I'm you. I'm old enough now. I'm kind of stepping aside, you know. I got my book written. <laughs> I'll add a couple of more hotels to my portfolio. But you know, I've done it. I'm I'm not gonna say I'm tired, but I'm I'm enjoying life. I love that. I'm gonna just ask you one last question about your mm -hmm. book, Walk Through Fire, a memoir of love loss and triumphs and thank you for that word honestly like I, I really do appreciate that but I'm just curious like what do you want people to take from that like you said you spent two years writing it you spent your whole life living it it's a lot to put like a life into right. a book and so just what do you want people like to get from that book well I'm going to leave you with this and this is in the epilogue of my book and I say if I could go back in time to talk to my younger self I would tell her this, trust your instincts, get to know who you are before you give yourself to someone else. Believe that you can find happiness and that you deserve it. You're going to be okay. Wow. You're going to be okay. Beautiful. Wow. Well, Miss Sheila Johnson, I thank you so much for taking the time. I literally took this interview. Anybody that's listening, I just wanted to have a conversation with you. because <laughs> I, just, I just think that everything you've done, you've paved the path that, I mean, you made a big road now. There's, it's been done before. You know, a lot of times they say to get the first one is the hardest one. And so you've done a lot of the heavy lifting for a lot of us. So I just thank you for everything that you've done. And man, I'm, I'm just excited to just see, like, I know you said, like, you're in your third act at this point. And it's like, man, like, look at the first two. So we can only imagine what's going to happen next. So just thank you for joining me. You're so welcome. This was delightful. Thank you. Energetic vampires. Man, that's a word because think about this. You get to have a conversation with a billionaire and you ask that billionaire for some advice. And that billionaire tells you to be on the lookout for energetic vampires. Well, clearly that's what just happened to me. So my mind is still stuck on that idea of energetic vampires because that's interesting. Because when you think of energy, you might think of somebody that's supporting you. Yeah, they're hype for me. They're energetic. They got all energy. You know what I'm saying? Beyonce talked about that, but it's like energetic vampires. So they, man, that is a word because it is easy when you're starting to do well. I know everybody always hears this like, of course, when you're starting to do well, people want to attach to you. But kind of sounds like what she's telling me is I need to pay attention to who might want to attach to me or this is you because every time I talk to people I hope y'all are listening too and y'all take some gems from it because these are really people that are really out here doing it like Sheila Johnson is really out here a billionaire that's crazy like we talk about millionaires man all 200 dollars dates and would you take dinner with jay-z or x amount of money i'm talking to a billionaire right here and this billionaire just told me to be careful for energetic vampires and i'm like whoo because i got a lot of energy you guys know like my kind of thing is toxic positivity i don't even want to hear the negativity but this is a word because I am like, you know, I call everybody fam. If y'all follow me on social media, if you know me or if you've seen me at a game on the road, I really treat everybody like we're family until proven otherwise. So I'll be like, what up fam? But if you do some weird stuff, okay, we not family. Like family don't act like that. But I really do treat everybody as like, you are my family until proven otherwise. Now my snook, she doesn't really love that about me because she always, you know, as parents, they're scared of that for me because I trust people too much. But something Sheila Johnson also said to me is trust your gut. Crazy. Because that is the thing that I think that, you know, when you like God protects you, it's like I have a great gut. Like I can walk into a room and know this ain't where I'm supposed to be. Like I can literally walk into a room and know this is not where I'm supposed to be. This is not the kind of room I'm going to be in and all of this. And you know what also made me think about um uh, this is the second billionaire. <laughs> this is the second billionaire that told me to trust my gut, like told me specifically, but I don't think they're specifically talking to me. I think they're talking to everybody because we all have that thing that when you're in danger or when you like, listen, I saw a tweet and it may, and this is random, but Roy tweeted that if he's in a bar and they start singing Sweet Caroline in unison, he know that's not where he's supposed to be. And it's kind of like, that's a joke, but it's kind of funny where it's like, you know where your instincts tell you where and where you should not be. 
I know if somebody starts saying sweet Caroline, oh, 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 I know that I'm about to turn up tonight because I know all of them. They not going to out sing me. I mean, country roads. I'm from West Virginia. You not going to out karaoke me. So maybe that's a room I need to be in. But discernment, energetic vampires, trusting your gut, man. This is advice from people that have made $1 billion. And this doesn't mean that's the end all be all because we know. All billionaires don't necessarily have morals. All billionaires aren't going to necessarily give you the best advice. We know that. We see that live on Twitter, X, wherever. We know that. But I'm going to take advice from some good billionaires. And Sheila Johnson and Larry G, anything they have to tell me, my ears is wide open. And I hope y'all's are too. All right? Like, we're trying to give y'all generational nuggets. Because it's a generational thing here at MoCo. We'll see y'all next week, man.